right, welcome into the Chris Collinsworth podcast. And what you are doing today is you're going to be in on a working session with my man, Mike Renner, who I will take over anybody, any of these draft gurus that are out there. This is the guy that we all rely on. He spends his entire year working and studying on this draft. And then a week before the draft, I come in and, and try and pick his brains and, and make some semblance out of it. So just I want to I want to be completely open and honest where I am. Um, I'm about 50 players into the draft. It okay. takes me about, I don't know how long it takes you. It takes me about an hour and a half to do a player. Um, I, I kind of went down your list. And so I have some idea of, of what the initial draft board was. And so now comes the fun part. Now's where you've seen the tape. I've seen the tape and we go back and forth go to and, battle and we go to battle. Yeah. We, we, and, and at the end of it, Neither one of us are right, and it doesn't matter. You know, it's like uh, you get on the show. Uh, but there's so many fun things, I think, to talk about with this draft because my initial impression when I first started doing it, you know, you know who the top 10 kind of candidates are. And my initial impression was, I don't like this draft. I, I just didn't think there were the, the, the top end players that you typically see in the draft. Do you agree, disagree with that one? I 100% agree. Like, I, I think after, like, even Aiden Hutchinson, who I think is still going to go number one overall, even he is probably going to be one of the weaker, you know, profiles of a number one overall pick, probably since, uh, you know, Eric Fisher went in 2013 at tackle. The, so probably the weakest since then. But even still, I, I really like him as a prospect. And then Derek Stingley from LSU is number two on the PFF board. That's like it in terms of guys who I see elite skill sets at the collegiate level that I would say call these like blue chip prospects. Like that is it. But from there, I think it goes about 40 to 50 deep of guys who are legitimate day one can be competent stars in the NFL. Like I think it's deep, but I think it's not top heavy. I got so many notes. This, this is the worst part <laughs> of the whole business. We're, we're going to get into Trayvon Walker. But my whole anyway. next week is going to be quite literally organizing my notes prior to the draft show so that what I want to say or the things I want to say about guys, I can actually remember come draft time and, and, not, and not have to do what you're doing it, right it's here. It's <laughs> the hardest. It is absolutely the hardest part of the whole thing. So I, I just went some big picture notes, and mm -hmm. we'll try to go through a little fake mock draft here before we're said and done here today. So I, I, I'll start with the quarterbacks. Um, I, I, I came down to two different categories of people. If you have to have somebody <clears throat> that's ready to play this year, mm -hmm. Carolina, Seattle, you know, whatever you want to say, um, Kenny Pickett or Desmond Ritter probably would be, you yes. know, the, the guys that I would want. If you had time to wait and develop, then to me, Malik Willis and Sam Howe are the two guys that I would take in my draft. 1,000%. I, that's like the best way to say it, actually, because I don't even want to rank these quarterbacks because you have four-year starters in Desmond Ritter and Kenny Pickett who've played a ton of football and who have done like operated in more NFL translatable offenses with NFL concepts, but they aren't as talented as Sam Howe and, and Malik Willis or even Matt Corral, I throw in the mix there. Like th those guys are the more talented playmakers, athletes, whatever you want the position. They've just played in either joke offenses, well, joke offense for literally all of them. Like none of the offenses any of those guys played in is anywhere near translatable to the league and have not played as much football. You know, two years of starting from Leak Willis, two years starting from Matt Corral, three years for Sam Howell, but, and a young guy coming out as a true junior. So that's how I see it that I would chase in a quarterback class where no, none of these guys I see as like really polished high-end prospects why not chase that what, what you just said there the the tools why not chase what they could be because there's legitimate reasons why they aren't the polished guys that we're seeing in Ritter and Pickett um and, and we're going to spend a lot of time on Willis here in just a second but Sam Howe is the one I feel like nobody's talking about uh Sam Howe's quarterback from North Carolina 6'1 218 uh, if you can put on the tape and not say Tim Tebow's name I don't know you know how you do it but, yeah. but the difference is that this guy can throw the ball he just doesn't want to I mean I I, I can't tell you how much of his tape I'm watching 
And I'm going, this guy really has a good arm, a good delivery, a tight delivery. He releases it quickly. But like he's he's like an MMA fighter. He just wants to go get in the fight. He wants to run the ball and he wants to go punch him in the face himself. And he doesn't want to sit in there. But when he does, and I don't think he's sophisticated as a passer, it would take it would take time. It would mm -hmm. take at minimum a year, I think, to get him ready to make quarterback reads and and to do the things he'd need in the NFL. But as far as just a skill set, he's got that. Yeah. To me, he's easily the most impressive downfield passer in this class. Like deep balls, drive throws, post digs, those sort of throws. Like he hits them with arm strength, accuracy. He has that skill set. The only thing is, like you mentioned, the the wanting to run, the breaking the pocket, the sacks he took this last year. It wasn't necessarily a new thing, but it really just you go back to a sophomore tape when he had weapons and guys that he trusted at the receiver position. It was not near. Like, I think he had half as many rushing yards as a sophomore as he did as a junior. So he just started stopping, you know, stop trusting his guys, stop giving his guys the opportunities. And just if that first read wasn't there, he was gone. He was out the pocket trying to make it all happen on his own. And so he put too much on himself this past year. But yeah, like if you flip his, you know, if you flip flop his junior and sophomore tapes, and I know you can't do that, he would be, he would have been the quarterback one in this draft class. Like if his last year's tape happened, this 2021 happened in 2020, whatever. You know what I'm trying to say. But sure. if we saw a sophomore tape as a junior, he would have been quarterback one in this draft class, which is kind of the reason I still gravitate towards him towards the top of this class. So uh, Taysom Hill, uh, you know, uh, Sean Payton made the same argument all those years about Taysom Hill. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Taysom Hill got a chance and was had moments, right? But didn't end up developing into that guy. Yeah. Am I going down the same rabbit hole if I go Sam Howe that I that he was ta trying to take me down with Taysom Hill? I think Taysom's just a little bigger. Like even Tebow was a little bit bigger at the quarterback position. So Sam Howell is like six foot two twenty, which is good size, is good running back size. But I'm not sure I'm really going to lean completely into him being this battering ram quarterback at the next level. I think he's probably not going to, it's probably going to look a little bit worse. He's not that high end athlete. I think you could do that Malik, with Malik Willis if you really want to. But with Sam Howell, I think he's going to be an add on the running game, but not fully buy in. That's all he is. He feels like if you're completely sold on the RPO game mm -hmm. and, you know, you just want somebody that's, that's what we're doing, right? He has the ability. I mean, I saw him against FSU throw a 63 yard Hail Mary. So he's got plenty of arm. I, you're not worried about that, but can you really teach him the NFL game or do you, is it okay for you to go? I, I'm good. The first two or three years, we're just going to RPO this thing and run the football in mm -hmm. Philadelphia in the Indianapolis, you know, name one yeah. team, San Francisco, no, San Francisco, not take the one, but you get the picture. <laughs> yeah. If he, I mean, if he falls the second round to someone like Indy, I, I'd pull the trigger there, like truthfully, because I think, you know, or someone who already has kind of an older quarterback or maybe a stopgap quarterback, maybe even like the Saints, like that to me, if he gets any sort of red shirt ability, like ability to really adjust to the NFL game, I think he'll flourish in the NFL. All right, I, I, we've got to do a little Malik Willis now because I think in many ways he is he's the guy. Um, I, I, I have all kinds of conspiracy theories. One, <clears throat> he feels like a Detroit Lion to me, you know, and, and I, I it's hard for me to get past that because that franchise, we know what they want to do. They want to play Smash Mouth, <laughs> and they're good at it. I mean, I watched quite a bit of Detroit Lion tape um, last year, getting ready for other teams. And they were given the Pittsburgh Steelers of the world who pride themselves on being really physical teams. They were giving them fits. They were beating them up. Yeah. Uh, and so now you go, well, what if I took a Malik Willis here and plug him in and we run from the quarterback position and, and create big plays with his big arm down the field while he's learning – how to play the quarterback position. To me, you still have time there, right? Or you, Jared Goff is going to be there. And and so let him play and, and let Malik sit on the sidelines and learn from somebody like that and be ready in year two. Is there any scenario in your mind where that happens? There is. And Dan Campbell in his 
in a press conference, I believe it was like two weeks ago, was asked, you know, what do you look for in quarterbacks? And he even said he wants someone that can create big plays, a quarterback that can create big plays. Well, like, if you look for a quarterback in this class that can create big plays, it's Malik Willis. I don't think I've seen a quarterback who was more like a running back, like a top prospect quarterback that was had a skill set that was closer to a running back. I mean, obviously, he's not Lamar Jackson as a runner, Lamar Jackson, but Lamar Jackson is more like a wide receiver in terms of his build. Kyler Murray, close, is more like a scat back. But like Malik Willis could be a three-down NFL running back. If or a really fullback. He or, be, yeah. <laughs> he's like, unbelievable. He's six foot 200, 220. Like, he is six foot 220 and broke more tackles than Kenneth Walker did last year. So, yeah, I, I think that immediately gives you a high floor, and especially if you're going to really buy into it wholesale to make him that rushing threat in your offense. That gives you a high floor, and then you don't have to be a complete, you know, you don't have to look like Mac Jones as a quarterback. You don't have to look like Tom Brady. You can just get by on that, plus the bombs over the top. That can be an explosive offense still in the NFL. I mean, Malik Willis and Kenny Pickett debate is sort of like the Justin Fields, Mac Jones thing. You know, a they're playing ago. a different game. You yeah, know? <laughs> like, I mean, it's like you, you, you've got to make a decision on who you're going to be, and I think Detroit yes. has made that decision. And so now, why would you not? let kind of it out that you would like to be interested in him. Well, if you're number two, obviously there may be somebody else mm -hmm. who likes him more and would be willing to trade up and Jacksonville would love to get out of it. So you would have to, if you really wanted Malik Willis, you would have to keep that so quiet. You probably wouldn't even tell anybody inside your building yeah. that you were going to do it much like San Francisco mm -hmm. a year ago for fear that somebody might like him actually more than and you go do. Get. Yeah, I agree. And there's no, it doesn't behoove you whatsoever to obviously any interest in any player. But I also do think there could be a situation where they love Malik Willis, would draft Malik Willis at two. If Aiden Hutchinson falls to two, they would also, they could have, you know, weigh the pros and cons of both and say, well, you know, we're going to take Aiden Hutchinson in that, in that scenario. Yeah, um, Trayvon Walker. I I can't go around this. We're we're gonna we're gonna get into this uh, deeply here. Um, I know you're Aiden Hutchinson. Mm -hmm. You were the guy that found him before anybody else found him. I give you credit for that, and he probably will be the number one overall pick. I, I always <clears throat> I tell my kids all the time. It's like when you get stuck on an answer to something, just say money, and you'll be right ninety nine percent of the time. And I don't know what the other one percent <laughs> is, but a uh, uh, Trayvon Walker. In Jacksonville, <clears throat> my voice is gone. In Jacksonville is a fan base draw to some extent. I don't, it's not like a quarterback, but to some extent, you like having a little fan base. Georgia, obviously, mm -hmm. right there next to Jacksonville. And Aiden Hutchinson, a Michigan guy. There's a little bit of logic there if you just start following the cash as far as some of this goes. Well, not only that, not only the Michigan guy, a Jim Harbaugh guy who Trent Balky famously is at war with like they they hate each other now after the separation in san francisco so that could be a factor oh, in this i like too. that i that I, that, that I like that i just kind of put the tea leaves together earlier this week when i was thinking about it, looking at balky and his background i'm like oh yeah wait he was harbaugh like the harbaugh connection so that could be not to say that you know not to spread any false rumors here but like deci decisions have been made over lesser stuff you know oh. bad decisions have been made over smaller things at the nfl and, and balky has a long history of taking athletes yes. whoever he thinks is yes, the yes. best athlete and i'm not saying one of these guys is a better athlete than the other i think mm -hmm. you can you can argue that either way uh that you want but if he were to think one were the better athlete that may well decide it. he had a very interesting sort of draft track record with the 49ers and just what he coveted with a ton of injured guys, a ton of just high-end athletes that he's not <laughs> he's not operating kind of like, you know, maybe even the rest of the NFL is operating at the GM position. Yeah, and, and you know, then the other thing that I keep coming back to with Jacksonville is does one of these offensive linemen end up being the guy? I mean, if, if you want to let your quarterback have a little a little go um I, you know with the offensive lineman I, I sit there and i go and i everybody likes icky aquanu mm -hmm. and i think he's going to be a fantastic guard in this league or a right tackle maybe but i i look at i would if i'm going to make a big bet if i'm going to go to number one pick potentially i, I think evan neal is the huge upside that you would have yeah. but for me the guy who's the better player today 
If I had to go play a game tomorrow and plug in somebody at left tackle, I would take Charles Cross. I think he's the better pass protector. That's exactly how I see the class too. And why I never bought into the smoke of Evan Neal number one, Icky Kwan number one. Maybe maybe it's not smoke. Maybe they end up do going number one. We still really don't know. But if you're Trent Falk, you just, you know, obviously was very rumored to be on the hot seat. Like fans wanted him out already. If you draft an offensive tackle, and like I see the class similarly to you, to where I'm not sure I trust any of Aquanu or Neil, or even really Cross for that matter, to come in and be a plus pass protector right out the gate. So if you draft a left tackle number one overall, and he's a liability in pass protection for your number one overall pick quarterback, you are gone. You know, like you have to do better than that. You have to find a better option somewhere or just find some certainty somewhere. And that's why obviously they franchise take Cam Robinson again, because at least he's not a dumpster fire at left tackle to where if you came in the guy was not NFL ready you're just you're fired mid-season like if you have pass protection issues with your number one overall pick the guy that drafted him is which you're going to have yeah I mean like which is what I think I think you are going to you you're going the the great thing about drafting a a pass rusher and I I I think it's it's probably three of the best five or six players in this draft are pass rushers so Mm -hmm. let's you know we get that out of the way right there but pass rushers you know a, a tackle or a corner they give up one touchdown or give up one sack they had a bad day yes right so but a pass rusher if he doesn't get a sack in a game nobody's screaming for your head mm-hmm. right it's a safer play it's no one a, knows if they missed a run fit yeah right. It's no, like, uh, right no and yeah. nobody gives a, a hoot about any of that stuff so if, if you're going for safety that's probably the way to, to end up going with the thing the wide receiver position is a really interesting one for me too. Um, I have three guys that I think deserve unique sort of attention in this one. Um, uh, one's Jameson Williams, the speedster. Of course, he's got coming off the the knee injury. Um, Drake London, that uh, the guy's a freak rebounder. He should he belongs in the NBA. He doesn't belong. I mean, he can get. He a, did play basketball for USC. Did he? Yeah. Uh, I mean, he year. he can reach over anybody and make a catch. I, I've never, and I think that he's going to be faster than people think. Um, he was coming off the injury. Mm-hmm. Uh, B big tall guys. I'm going to defend my people here. Big tall guys <laughs> are not 40 yard dash guys. Yeah. The 40 yard dash is all about the first 10 yards. And so if you're five foot six, you're going to get to 10 yards faster than somebody who's six foot four. Mm-hmm. To me, I would want to know what the 40 yard dash is from the 20 to the 60, if I were yeah. really doing it, you know, cause I don't, that's, that's the point at which a wide receiver has to hit the jets and go by somebody. Well, that's why Mike Evans, I mean, he's a deep threat. Even though he ran like four or five at the combine, he, Owens, when he's at the top speed. He is running by you. He's like a horse. Think about Usain Bolt. Yeah. If, if we consider the, best the 40 yard dash to be the fastest man in the world, Usain Bolt wouldn't have been in the top 100, I'll bet you. Mm-hmm. But for 100, I mean, when he got to 40, it was over, yep. right? He was going to run them all down at that point. So I, I just. Say, keep that in mind when you're remembering that our, my, my people, these tall wide receivers out there. And my third one that I think is deserves in that upper echelon is Garrett Wilson. Um, he's got enough of the speed. He's got the hands. He's got a little bit of the Cooper Cup um, kind of wiggle in him um, to be able to, to do that. Um, I, that's, that's the one. And, and I, I've got to say, a couple of these guys at the bottom end of it, and there'll be guys in between these guys get drafted, but I like Sky Moore a lot from Western Michigan. And Jahan Dotson. I, I think Jahan Dotson's one of the smartest receivers that I've seen in a while. He plays wide receiver like he used to play quarterback. And I mm-hmm. saw him take a couple of direct snaps, and he threw a pass. So maybe he did play quarterback in high school or whatever. But he he gets what the quarterback is seeing and how to get into the holes and, and make easy throws. Hot reads, he gets his head around. He understands the game. Yeah, I that's going to be the first time we disagree. It's not to say that I, I do think Jahan Dotson understands the game. I just think he is going to be a slot receiver at the next mm. level. And that's good. And that's like – I agree. And that helps. No, no, no. Like, I agree okay. with that. All right, all right. I think he's going to be have to be a slot wide receiver, which – 
it's not as big a death knell as maybe it once was for some offenses, but it's still like pigeonholing you some offense that's just not necessarily a role that gets you. Uh, I think he'll catch 100 balls in this league at some point. Ooh, okay. Be- because he understands. Yeah. So quarterbacks are going to get addicted to when it hits the fan, he's going to know what he's doing, you know, and, and mm-hmm. he's not a big guy at all. But man, he has a catch radius on him too. Yeah. He, oh, he's, yeah. he has the ability to go get the ball a little bit too. Um, uh, we'll just keep rolling on here because pretty soon now, as we go through this mock draft, we're going to find people we don't like, <laughs> you know, that, that so far you've been hearing the ones that I do like. Um, the the defensive interior, obviously the two Georgia guys, Jordan Davis, Devontae Wyatt, are just, you know, <laughs> sort of otherworldly. But I, I, I do think that um, – um, and, and who's the, the Davis is the bigger one, right? Yes, Jordan Davis. So Davis. Wyatt, I, I wrote down Davis in here, but I made a misprint. Um, so Wyatt is the guy, though. That is there any chance that he becomes the Warren Sapp? You know that, that he is he's a, whatever four seven eight kind of guy. He has that great first step. So much of George's defense was sort of team oriented attacking the passer kind of kind of mm-hmm. stuff but but is there a chance this guy becomes from the interior from the three tech a 10 sack guy i hope we're talking about warren sap on the field first off uh, uh, well yeah <laughs> Warren warren's my buddy so yeah but i'll definitely on the field Devonte though i i he, he, that's what the guys who produce at that level look like though right like the Absolutely. guys who are elite at the nfl level in terms of pass rushing ability have that get off, have that caliber of first step, quickness, whatever. The elite three techniques look like Devontae Wyatt. Kind of the only worry, and because he went to the senior bowl, and when he actually, you said the Georgia scheme limiting him, when he actually got to attack, he was he the highest graded player there in the week of practice. Devontae Wyatt was the highest graded player. Really? There. Did not lose. Like he was so dominant. That does in the one on one. He's 24 years old, though. It is kind of the one overarching thing. Oh. Redshirt senior. I don't know how it took him this long to really figure it out, but way older than you know the vast majority of prospects. He turned 24 last month. So the guy is uh, took him a while to get it going. But like you said, the athleticism is. I mean, I, I just I, maybe it's just the Aaron Donald effect on me after mm-hmm. watching the, all his playoff games and you know, all the study I had to do for the Super Bowl. But when you have that inside impact guy, you know, we always think of you got to have the edge rusher and then it helps mm-hmm. the inside guys. I don't anymore. I, I look at that interior push. You, I, almost every quarterback that I talk to, they don't care about edge rushers. They, they, nobody ever talks to me about being afraid of, of edge rushers because they can manipulate those guys. They can slide. They can yeah. chip. They can step up in the pocket. They can do things. Those interior guys that are – get up in their face, there's nothing you can do about that. Mm-hmm. And because I think the way the NFL game has gone with more spread formations, they have more space than ever before. So like if you are that high-end athlete, if you are Devontae Wyatt, like before it used to be, they used to be like pocket pushers because you literally had to push the pocket. You weren't, you didn't have the space to go left or right. You were going to bump into the center or bump into the uh, the tackle. So like these guys are actually going one-on-one with two-way goes in space a lot of the times to where you can – really separate yourself when you are an athlete like Devontae Wyatt and I mean four seven seven forty at his size and I get that Jordan Davis is elite too but like four seven seven forty with good short shuttle and good three cone for a defensive tackle this guy can really move. I, I I think all of these DTs are probably the one position that go higher come draft day than they're getting mocked right now for a lot of teams. Like I think Devontae Wyatt's floor is the mid teens. Jordan Davis floor is like fifteen even Travis Jones is going to go in the first round, the Kentucky, Connecticut defense tackle. Like those guys are going to go high in this draft. The, the other part of it is, for a Jordan Davis is that the league is all sort of moving in the same direction. So everybody now is trying to play the lightest box possible and keep as many coverage people yeah. back as you can. Two deep safeties. You've heard us all talking about it. So does that lend yourself more to it because I you always think oh he's a two down player right Jordan mm-hmm. Davis three hundred and forty pounds he's a you know he's a, a two down player he's off the field on third down which is probably true um, but at the same time is it now so important 
to be able to play minimum two gaps if you're a defensive tackle inside and maybe two and a half to three in reality because they are keeping the extra guy back yes and so like the run you know 15 years ago linebackers were you know run run first players for a lot of teams that run first did miss has transitioned all the way to the defensive line like you got to be run first for your defensive tackles for a lot of schemes or else you know you you can give up pass rush you can you can accept that you know if a guy isn't going to look like Devontae white if a guy isn't going to look like aaron donald one of these top end pass rushers don't even like you'll you'll throw that out the window for a guy that can really just plug up holes so it goes back to why i said i think jordan davis is going to go higher than where he's getting mocked right now is because that skill set is every defense wants it you know it's not just oh, you know, he's a two-down player. No, everyone needs that two-down player nowadays. Uh, Belichick's done that for years, yeah. right? I mean, he was perfectly happy with Vince Wilfork. I don't care if you ever get to the quarterback. You just make sure nobody runs in here. And, and yeah. he did, you know, he did for sure. Um, all right, Aiden Hutchinson and Trayvon Walker. Here we go. So to me, I, I worry less about who goes one, two, three, four, you know, th th those three players are unique. You know, I mean, they're, they're going to, they're going to stand, uh, they're going to be separated from the rest of these guys. Um, and Aiden Hutchinson, you were on very early. I can't, I don't know that it would be much more than a coin flip for me, which one of the three is going to end up more successful. Mm -hmm. um, Thibodeau, I, I think has been, riddled <laughs> i mean this is like bonnie and clyde the closing scene this guy's been shot in every direction so far and you know some of it deserved i mean he whatever his comment was about oh, i don't think any coach can teach me anything and i'm like oh here we go oh, i mean he has brought a lot of it on himself yeah he he has um but he's legit he's a, he was the top recruited guy in the country the whole thing uh, Aiden Hutchinson, we've gone over him, and and I, I've heard you on uh, with Austin and your guys' podcast that that you know, okay, Trayvon Walker did this at the combine, but Aiden Hutchinson had athletic numbers that you know are off the charts mm -hmm. too, as far as that. Uh, Trayvon Walker is probably a guy that you know when I first started the process. I was like, you know what? I go, this is this is all smokescreen stuff. And then I put on the tape because he doesn't have it. And we had Kirk Herbstreet in here yesterday. And he says the same thing that, that you're saying. It's like, it just wasn't there. You know, he didn't make those plays that we've seen Aiden Hutchinson make and we saw Thibodeau make uh, over time. Um, you know, he, Kirk was saying, yeah, he, he's making one play a game, you know, and I'm like, I, 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 I don't deny that. I, I don't deny that. Uh, but I also kind of had that feeling on Rashawn Gary when he was coming mm -hmm. out. He just never made a play on the ball, you know, and now all of a sudden Rashawn Gary has been taught to play. The the other part of, of Trayvon Walker, and this is a debate about who's the first overall pick was that he played everywhere you know he played as many snaps at, or felt like as many snaps at nose tackle the one technique as he did the three technique as he did the five technique uh as he did anything else mm -hmm. he's very athletic in space I, I swear i think he could play off ball linebacker if he, he wanted to he just i mean his testing numbers would be good for a cornerback you know if really? he, like truthfully like if he they do not look out of place the only thing that looked a little out of place in terms of like projecting a cornerback would be his uh short shuttle that's it everything else is good for a cornerback yeah i mean <laughs> four four or five speed he's he he can play he i saw him spy a few times from a one technique it's like you know that's that's a pretty yeah. amazing thing to think about your nose tackle going to be your spy and there usually it's one of the most athletic guys uh he, the, his ability to to get out on those wide receiver screens so fast that you know the 35 and a half inch arms with that full extension where you can separate from guys that that uh is doing that you know to me the problem is 600 snaps um and but i i, I also like i watched a lot of tape on him so what do you have five sacks on a year or something like that but I mean, he flat out missed four where he won. Mm -hmm. 
So if that number, and, and not that everybody didn't miss sacks, I don't want to, you know, do that. Um, but let's say he puts those four guys on the ground and he comes up with those sacks and he's sitting there with nine sacks right now. Are we having a different conversation at this point or are you still, you're all in? No, I, I still don't think it's that different <clears throat> of a conversation. Um, I, I will say, I mean, as far as tools go, there may not have been, I've at least not seen better tools for the edge position in terms of like athletic ability. And since like better than even Miles Garrett has coming out in terms of freaky athleticism, the off burst off the football, like all of that, it's there. But like it's still, at the end of the day, somewhat a skilled position to really impact at the highest of high levels. So I do worry about that. I mean, going to the PFF grading system, well, even if he finished those sacks, like the grading system is irrespective of that, the grades he gets. He had 13 plays the entire season. And that's through the playoffs, two playoff games, a conference championship, 13 plays that earned a plus one or higher. Aiden Hutchinson had 79 plays that earned a plus one or higher. So that's about six times more a game. You're six times as many over the course of the season. That is, and that's just a massive, massive difference that I don't think it's overcome by the athletic. Like, I, I think also, like, a Hutchinson is a freak athlete. Kayvon Thibodeau is a freak athlete. Like we're haggling between guys who all have the tools to do it at the NFL level. And at that point, just I'll take the guys further along in his development. I'll take because, the ones that did it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I can't disagree with it, but I also I I know what Balky is, mm -hmm. and I know he's going to sit there and go, I don't care what he did. You know, I I want I want the freakiest of the freaky athletes. And if you had those three guys, Hutchinson, Thibodeau, and Walker, and you just looked at it from that lens, what would you do? Oh, I mean, Walker's the freakiest, for sure. Like, But after that, honestly, I think Aiden Hutchinson's the second freakiest in this class. I think he's a better projectable athlete. The only thing he lacks, really, in his profile is arm length because he had similar 10 splits to Thibodeau and Walker, which – that's really all you should care about for an edge. I mean, obviously you want to chase guys down in space, that helps, but if you really rush the passer, just getting off the line of scrimmage is all that really matters at that point. So similar 10 splits, so wash there, but then he had the best three cone and not even close in that, like an all time three cone. Which, Talking about Hutchinson? Yeah, Hutchinson. And that's like, three cone is turning the corner to rush the passer. That is, you know, you take a turn, you make another turn and then another turn. And that's how like, getting around the corner and the edge work. So the only way to adjust a three cone better in at the defensive end position since they started tracking the combine was JJ Watts. So that's good company. It's, it's so funny. It's like, I, I kind of find myself going back and forth on those guys. I, I mean, I just, I don't know why it's not like I've got to make the pick, but you know, it's like, it, it really is an interesting one. Is there another guy uh, below that, I, I know that you know there's there's a lot of them. Jermaine Johnson, Benito, Mafe. I don't even say not to say Karloftis, um, Ajabo. That's too bad. Ajabo with yeah. the Achilles. He, I thought he was a good player too. Heard his he's the other Michigan guy mm -hmm. uh, opposite Aiden Hutchinson and tore his Achilles on his on the pro day. But is there, if you had to take the next one, like I, I found when I was kind of trying to do a mock draft, I'm like, oh, I got to pick out one of those next guys, you know, and I kind of put them all in that. Uh, like for me, I I had uh, Mafe, Johnson, and Benito ahead of Karloftis uh, in the next tier for me. And then I put a Jabo with Karloftis in, in sort of the third tier of that. But I, I'm, I'm really, I think that was one of the hardest things for me to try and split those guys. Yeah, if you're, if you're talking about, you know, who would anyone else in the conversation for like top pick or would I put, have even think about putting anyone above those three? Probably not if you're talking about number one overall pick. But I do think George Karloftis would be quite easily after those three, the next guy on, that I would take. Like I think the assuredness of what you're getting, the how developed he is already for a true junior coming out a young guy the work ethic all the whole background information on him like he was a he's on the creek national water polo team he's got this unique background where he's just an absolutely driven monster who's going to do whatever it takes to be successful at the nfl level 
like tried to move into the facilities at Purdue when he was there and is already like one of the strongest players in this draft class in terms of just like physical play strength. Oh, he's, he's plenty he's strong ox. enough. I, there's no doubt about that. I, I didn't know, and it was probably unfair for me. And this is why you have to go back and do the tapes again, the week of, you know, because I just watched the big three. I watched Hutchinson, Walker and Thibodeau mm -hmm. and went to Karloftis next. And so there's a gap, you know, yes. to me in the athleticism Athletic. there. And then I got to come back to uh, Mafe and Johnson and Benito, you know, and you go, oh, wow, they're more athletic than that guy. So <laughs> it, it always does. It's a, it's a little bit, it's an interesting take that, that you liked him that much. What, what would you do with an Ajabo that, you know, the kid that was he, did he do enough to eke his way into the first round despite the injury? I don't think so. And it's more, it has a lot to do with kind of his profile. Like he hasn't played a lot of football. He didn't play until his junior year of high school. Um, was a soccer player growing up in Scotland. And so he's not necessarily like he's very early along in his development, but like he's, he, I'm not calling him a pure project. Like he had a lot of pass rushing moves, but like the physicality of the game, still like adjusting to basically how to play the game of football. So for a guy like that to miss, now his entire rookie season, like the timeline for his Achilles is he's not even going to be able to play and not even going to get an adjustment period where that adjustment period starts in year two. He may not be good until year four, year five. And so if that, that is a free so, agent. so, so oh, yeah, yeah, like you're kind of burning your rookie deal with, if you do draft him. So I, I can't see how, despite, you know, him, if he was healthy, being probably a top 20 pick in this class, I think he falls out of like the top 50 at this point. The, the, the big three of the pass rushers, I think, will go before any of the cornerbacks. Um, but I, I will say this. I love the secondary in this draft. If there's one, I, I, I like the safeties. I like the corners. I, I, I think this has a chance uh, to be a very back-end heavy first round. I think the top corners are more special for their respective position. In the, in the top safety, Kyle Hamilton, than any of these edge rushers or any of the offense tackles. Now, the offense tackles and edge rushers are going to go first because that's just the nature of the game. But they're just talking, you know, putting it in a vacuum and saying all positions, like who's the better prospects for said position? It's Derek Stingley, it's Sauce Gardner, and it's Kyle Hamilton. So I, I, I can't argue with that. But I, I, I think that even the other guys, you know, McDuffie out of Washington, Andrew Booth out of mm -hmm. Clemson, even uh, Elam out of Florida. I mean, Elam is a pro-looking cornerback to me. And he he was not – he was better, I guess it was the year before, yes. um, than what he was this last year, but so was Stingley. So, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to knock that. But I, I – I, corners are so valuable in this game right now. I mean, you have to have, if you don't have four that can play, they're going to, they're going to spread you out in this league now, and they're going to only go after your one week link. So uh, I was, I was really happy to see that. Um, but there's some really interesting safety play on the back end as well. I mean, Kyle Hamilton, we know about him. I'm, I'm going to give the same speech, my six foot four, Four six forty guy who, but when the ball's yeah. in the air, he got there. Yeah, he got there all year. The play, some of the plays he made against FSU were just off the charts uh, with what he was able to do there. Uh, but these other guys, seen and Petrie's an interesting guy. That whole slot, you know, uh, position. Uh, Daxton Hill can fly. I th I think Daxton Hill who got played in the slot almost all the time. You run 4-3-8. You've got a guy who can who can play middle field safety if you need that. You got a guy who can cover in the slot. He may not be the best coverage slot guys, but mm -hmm. but he can he can certainly do that. Um and, but you know, to me most importantly, you know, if you play him at free safety and drop him down on occasion and play a cover zero or whatever, you got a four three eight guy running playing a position. It just gives you that versatility on your defense that all these guys are looking for. Yeah, I think he ends up going in the first round, and because he's got a skill set that, like you said, is not is unique. That if you're a man heavy team, team plays a lot of man or man match, man concepts, whatever. 
that's that's your guy in this class. You're you're not looking anywhere else at the safety position because of that. Like he could legitimately, with his tools, he could play outside corner if he wanted to. I I, I agree with that. His wingspan's only a half inch shorter than Kyle Hamilton's wingspan, and he's six foot tall. Is that right? Yeah, he's pterodactyl at that at that size. <laughs> Massively broad shoulders. I mean, that's that's what you want though, and that's what that's far more important than pure height at the NFL level is the wingspan. Um, so it's going to be fun. I, I I think it's a defensive heavy draft in my mind, Agreed. not that there aren't good players on the other side. Um, but you know, it, it's, it's not, <clears throat> it's not an exciting draft, <clears throat> mostly because the quarterback position isn't there. I don't have any running back going in the first round. I, the Iowa state kid, I, I, I like him as a runner. He has a little Le'Veon Bell patience to him and, and, the whole thing, he won't block anybody. I mean, I, I put on every pass blocking play. That's a great thing about PFF. Yeah. You can go in and just go, let me show pass protect. But I saw him have one bad pass protection. I was like, oh, I better check this. He didn't block anybody all year. He had a couple of cut blocks, but he didn't stand up and take on anybody. Walker, too. They, none of them, neither of them really wanted I'm to. Like, Some I, business decisions. I, I, I'm out. I, I do like the, the inside linebackers a little bit, though. I have to say, that, and and one of the reasons I do I do like let me find the, this kid, um, Devin Lloyd out of Utah, that he's not as so. There's two. There's Nicobe Dean right out mm -hmm. of Georgia who can fly. Who who did, did they ever come up with a forty yard dash time on him? Never tested pre draft because he looks exactly. like he can run. I know. And if you can run, why would you not? Because if he runs four five or four five five. I think he's I think he's your pick because he could plug into a Tampa defense, play man coverage on anybody and run with, you know, a running back or mm -hmm. a tight end down the field. Uh Devin Lloyd uh, to me is a polished looking player that just understands the game. He just knows what's going on. But he also has a trait that I really like and that's the ability to make people miss when he's blitzing. He he looks like a, a tailback coming through there they could just keep missing him with running backs trying to block him yeah i think he ends up a patriot because of and maybe doesn't fit their exact size profile but he can legitimately rush the passer like off the edge if you wanted him to he has a six foot nine inch wingspan at six three another guy who's insanely long for a linebacker that that's plays in coverage that's rushing the passer you're talking like, about lloyd Devin lloyd yeah wow. compared to nicobe dean like five inches bigger wingspan so I, I, I think that I think that he's going to go, you know, he, he doesn't have the great 40 time. So that one, that hurts him a little bit, but four, six, six, not bad. But I just, I just feel like that that was a guy that, that understood the game in a way like, like yeah. I, I could see Robert solid just going, I got to have that guy, you know, I just, just want yeah. to be a surprise pick. I think for a lot of people, but just to have somebody operate your defense that can get after the quarterback, that understands the space of playing the linebacker position, I thought he was really impressive. I could see someone very easily falling in love with him because of that, like you mentioned, like the way he plays the game. And now some of that's also because he is another old guy. He turns 24 as a rookie, too. Uh, every time I like somebody, <laughs> they're like old. Somebody, I got to tell them they're old. But, but that's – I mean, if they're old and already good – that's it's not that big a deal then. They're already going to be good in the NFL field. That's how I feel about Lloyd, though. Okay, let, let's let's do a little exercise here, and and we won't go through everything, but um, it, it, there's eight teams in this draft that have two picks, yes, and eight teams that don't have any. Um, so uh, something weird's going to happen, right? So let, let's see if we can guess what the weird is, you yeah. know, because we were always we we're always have that first moment where everybody goes ah you know and that, that's it's the fun part of the draft um so uh, the saints I, I think you have to start with the saints they make the trade with philadelphia so they've got two middle round picks ordinarily when you do that you're getting ready to trade up mm -hmm. for something right um so they they lose their left tackle and Armstead and good player. So is it possible they're going to trade up to get one of the, the top tackles? Maybe, because in my opinion, you don't get a pass protector below that. Um, Jameis Winston is likely their quarterback. Is that good enough for you? I mean, do you see a Malik Willis now 
with Dennis Allen there. Now you've got a whole different philosophy. Are we going to play the defense and have a quarterback that can we can develop and we're going to make a trade up and go get somebody like that? What do you think the Saints are doing here? This is, this is intriguing to me. I, I did think when they made that move that it was posturing for a trade up on draft day because to just get a first rounder this year and just draft two players in the first round I'm not sure how much that behooves you like this far out why not make that trade then on draft day when you're trying to maneuver for a trade but this makes it more palatable to not have to give up all this weird draft capital to then move all the way up for a team who may not necessarily want those future picks may just want the picks in this year's draft so it makes it easier to do on draft day and if you're moving up and doing all that for a pick on draft day i just think it's going to be for a quarterback like i think it would be for someone like if detroit doesn't take malik willis Carolina doesn't take Malik Willis because I don't think they will, truthfully. And it gets down to number seven with the Giants. I think they'd be trying to get up there and trying to get a Malik Willis, something but, like that. But, but if you did that, if, if he falls that far, mm -hmm. isn't it possible he would fall all the way to you with your ordinary pick? Yeah, well, Seattle's because, in because there. Because that was, that's what I was thinking. That, mm -hmm. okay, Carolina is sitting there and – Maybe they all, everybody thinks this Kenny Pickett thing is a ruse. Yeah. Like, forget it. That's, that's not happening, right? No, I mean, it could happen. I, I actually think that probably will happen. But if you're sitting there and you think that that is a smokescreen because they really want Malik Willis, you could easily jump up to five or four. Yeah. And because the Jets and Giants are sitting there with, multiple picks or three even if you felt like you had to i don't know why you'd feel like you had to do that um, but you could easily go get ahead of carolina to make sure you got the quarterback you wanted yes i do i do think that's if there's any sort of bigger plan here that would be it but they maybe just think they're close to winning a championship and want those picks right now it could be the other thing that they know their windows kind of running out and need the guys right at this moment. So I not exactly sure. Obviously we'll see come draft day, but that's, if I had to guess, they would be the team that would trade up for a quarterback. But I mean, Pittsburgh, I think would be willing to trade up for a quarterback too, but they would be the one who obviously has the capital to do so. I, I wonder if Pittsburgh's thinking, we just have to stay put. We're going to get one okay. of the, those, one of those two guys has fallen, but I'm not so sure. I, I every year that I think that quarterbacks aren't going to go, that's, there's always a game that's played that where they get up there to do that. Um, and then the other game that I find interesting is the whole Chiefs and Packers chasing wide receivers. Yeah. Right. They're be jockeying for the same guys. It seems. And they both have multiple picks. Mm -hmm. So it is, 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 you know, is there that guy that is going to be, you know, is it Jameson Williams that everybody's going to covet and just go, Hey, you know, I'm Kansas City. I don't Chips care. Up. I can wait six months for this kid to, to get well. Kansas City seems like the one team that I think could do that, could would be willing to do that, I'll say, and package it up and go get a guy like Jameson Williams if he falls to, you know, nine to Seattle and really wants to pull that trigger and go up and get him to replace Tyree Kill because you just look at even Andy Reid's draft history at the position. You know, everyone kind of has a type. The Packers type has not been speed types. The Packers type has been size yeah. size and route runners that's their type kansas city andy reed's type almost entirely sub low four four to sub four four wide receivers in his draft history he likes speed at that position so if they are going to move up that would be who it's for in my opinion maybe a lave but that's who it'd be for so you you would think green bay more of a drake london kind of guy is is you know somebody... drake london Traylon burks but they have to Pickens. go up. I, I think Drake London's going to go. I think so too, but uh, that's relatively who would, early. Who they'd be moving for if they're going to move for anyone. So if Green Bay has to go up, and maybe you understand these, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do they have? 23, 22, and 28. 22 and 28. Would that be enough to get them into one of those Jets or Giants picks? Oof. That one's not, not the Giants. I, I think they could leapfrog. They could flip that to Seattle, I bet, would be willing to move down from nine because Seattle just, they need players. I, I don't yeah. think pick nine's doing much for them. That That's an interesting, that's about where, because yeah. generally you see, like you probably have to get ahead of 
the Jets', Jets and second pick, right? Yeah. Jets, Jets and second Washington. Second pick in Washington are the point. two teams that very much in the wide receiver class. Yeah, yeah. So that, so okay, Seattle at nine might be a, a move spot. Um, I, 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 I keep thinking that this draft sort of starts um, with right ahead of Carolina. You know, whoever that 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 Carolina needing a quarterback so badly. Anybody else who's going to be in that mm-hmm. in that race? Do, does Seattle? Is there any chance that Seattle somehow tries to package something together to get ahead of that if they liked one of those quarterbacks? Because you know Carolina is going to trump them. That's the, the so Seattle and Atlanta are the two teams that are at the back end of the, of the top ten, where not a lot of people are really penciling in quarterbacks. People are kind of saying, oh, you know, they're in rebuilds. Maybe this isn't the year because I mean, you look at those rosters, they'll be drafting higher next year. Like they'll, they'll be drafting higher than eight and nine next year. So I think why a lot of teams or a lot of people are like, maybe this isn't the year for quarterback, but that's not how a lot of NFL decision makers probably make their decisions is saying, oh, look at next year's quarterback. Yeah, they might be fired by then. Exactly. Yeah. So I think these uh, some of those regimes there are looking and saying, you know, I got to find a way to save my job too. So they were both possibilities. Is there any like – I would so if I were a GM, and, and I told you this, I actually said this to a couple of people, the Philadelphia things, where I said I would be trading out of this draft into next year's draft. If I were looking at the potential of a quarterback, or if I were looking at mm-hmm. you know whatever, almost any position. Well, that was Philly. Philly was very shrewd. I mean, they gave Jalen Hurts this kind too. of this kind of this trial run. They gave him the two-year trial run, and if he looks like he did in the playoffs last year, at some points this year when he faces good defenses. They will have the ammo to go up and get a quarterback next year. In a better quarterback yeah. class, or at least anticipate. I mean, I think it will be. I, yeah. I think at least Bryce Young, at this point, has shown enough. He would have been quarterback one if he came out this year. Obviously, size concerns, needs to get bigger, but he was better on tape last year than any of these guys. Yeah. So, it, 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 but it really does come down for me is like Carolina seems to be that, are, are they really going to take, so if nobody mm-hmm. takes a quarterback ahead of them, now they're kind of in a spot, right? Now they've got – they're going to take Pickett probably because if I'm coaching that team, I'm thinking I don't have time to develop Malik Willis. I, I have to go win. At least Pickett has a little Drew Brees kind of thing to yeah. him, whatever, that he's going to be able to figure this thing out right away. And Malik Willis, you know, by the time he gets any good, I'm gone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why I keep saying Carolina can't pick. That, that one just – I think that is too – I do too. The Pittsburgh connection with the owner, the yeah. whole, the whole thing. Uh, I it's all right. Let, let's just let's just give it a go here. Let, let's let's and we're not held to this. So if you're listening, don't don't tweet out that we hate this guy and we don't do that. We, this is just this is for fun. This is not our final thing. We, we maybe we'll do a final thing some point next week. Um. So I, I'm I'm assuming. I can't find my board that I actually put together, so I'm going to do this off the top of my head here again. I'm assuming that that uh, you're not going with anything other than Aiden Hutchinson. Correct. So you're going Aiden Hutchinson. I, for the sake of fun, I am gonna I'm gonna go Trayvon Walker. I, I think that that's that fits bulky. That's that's history. Yeah. So we've already we've already debated that one. So now you get to Detroit. And I, I was talking about Carolina being a move team. To me, Detroit's a move team, too. Um, uh, I, I, if I were really going out on a, on a limb, I would take Malik Willis right here. I think so, too. I mean, if I'm take, projecting what's going to happen, I think so, too. Uh, I think they'd go Malik Willis. Yeah. The Texans, to me, is impossible because it's like, I mean, did you, I'd probably go with whoever whoever is left. If for whatever, so under this scenario, Aiden Hutchinson would be left for me. So I'll go Aiden Hutchinson. Yeah, I think I think Iki Kwanu. I think they'd go offensive tackle, try to build through that, and look for, I mean, Iki Kwanu is kind of like off-field sort of. Obviously, that's something the Texans covet. Pure. Is, yeah. Like yeah. He, is, he had offers from Harvard coming out of high school. He is right. a exactly he's you know a scholar off the field a monster on the field that the texans would probably covet yeah they would they would covet but i i mean if it's i think he's going to be a guard i just i, I can't i can't no, I, I, that I'm not, with a guard. i don't think it's crazy to say that yeah um and then number four is the jets is that right so the jets um um 
I, 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 I think a lot of Sauce Gardner. I, I you know, I, but I, I also that leaves me. I've got Thibodeau in place. So I, mm-hmm. I'd have to go Thibodeau. I think if if I had the fourth pick and and hope that I fell into sauce Gardner on the on the next pick i think trayvon walker so trayvon walker i think would come off the board here in my set because i had hutchinson right in the league, then icky now so you don't have Th- uh, thibodeau off so the no board came on thibodeau yeah wow there you go there we go so we five is the giants mm-hmm. right so the giants come up next and um you almost have to go the first offensive lineman in my mind. Whatever, I, I'm going to guess Evan Neal is is probably <laughs> that choice. I would guess Evan Neal here as well. Yeah. All right. So six. Now we get to Carolina, right? Um, and this is also assuming nobody is jumping ahead. Mm-hmm. You not know, trades. Yeah. yeah. That there's there's not a trade, which I'm not so sure that there won't be. Um, I, I, I can't come up with any scenario where, especially is with what we've got with Willis off the board, that they don't go Kenny Pickett. Yeah. I, they, they almost have to. Kenny Pickett here. That's, that's so here. Be the mock. So, um, all right. Let me let me see if I can come up with one scenario where maybe that is. Uh, not the case. I mean, realistically, what I would do if I was Carolina in this draft would be begging someone to come up and draft probably at this point, kind of how it's fallen, it's offensive tackle, begging someone to come up and get one of these offensive tackles that might need one. because. But, but none of them have made a bold enough. Like usually yeah. it's like, yeah, 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 I'm going to take this guy to force somebody to go ahead of him. You know what I mean? I just don't feel like anybody's played that game enough this year to make me really believe that there's a player there I got to have. Because there's not. You know, like, there, there's not. Thing. That's the problem. There's not that kind of class where you really there's no one to fall in love with. Okay, here's cool. here's my here's my dream scenario for draft night, yeah. which throws everything into a tizzy. Arizona trades Kyler Murray to Carolina. <laughs> it makes too much sense. That would throw a lot into a tizzy. Kyler Murray, I don't think, is going to be happy. I mean, I just some of the rumors that mm-hmm. I've heard about him in Arizona, and maybe I, I, I just don't know that that has a long term shelf life. And I'm not sure that they're ever going to pay him the 40 plus million dollars. Yeah. So if you're not going to, now, you know, obviously that throws Kingsbury into the, but he just signed, he and Kaim just signed a long term deal. And I know that would give them two straight quarterbacks that they bailed on. But if he's not going to show up in camp and he's going to, you know, the mm-hmm. whole thing, here's your chance to go load up on draft picks, probably for next year would be what I would want. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, to me, if there's a wild card in here, that's one. I think if there is like a wild card in terms of like actual big trades, that would be surprising because I don't foresee massive movement in this first round anymore because it's moved so much already. Um, it would be a player trade. Kyler Murray, DK Metcalf, AJ Brown, Debo Samuel, whoever it is, I, that would be the one, like an actual player getting moved on draft night is something that would really throw a wrench into this that I could see. But because I just don't, like you said, there's no one to trade. There's no one really to have this big movement for come draft day. Yeah. Um, Giants up next um so we got i think i we both gave him offensive mm-hmm. linemen go with the one evan neal five with the with the first one and now wow what would you do i'm going sauce Gardner here yeah. i think with the giants with that defense obviously james radbury is probably his last year there i, I think sauce Gardner. the only the only reason i would say potentially not is just oh, uh, because you, you don't even have Thibodeau off the board. No, yet. no Thibodeau yet. Not yet. <laughs> that, that would be soon. That would be a uh, that would be an interesting one for me with that one. Who did I have with that? Um, I you know I I I have a jeez. Sauce Gardner's not a bad pick. He's probably the next best player, although I probably would go Thibodeau 
um just to try it i'd break the giants or the jets heart with that kind of thing or stingley I, you know mm -hmm. stingley's that kind of player too I, I don't have a problem with sauce Gardner. that's probably a good right. one um the falcons the falcons are interesting too we got marcus mariota there right and is there i, I mean is there a possibility they could be in this quarterback market or in a, a quarterback trade kind of market with the Kyler Murray? They, they have, they need the picks is the problem with them. Like if, if Malik Wills falls to eight would not surprise me if they pull a trigger, I can't see them jumping up and really going and attacking Malik Willis though here. I think they just go either like edge or corner. Um, to me, the pick with how it's fallen would be Kayvon Thibodeau at this point. Yeah. Yeah, I, I probably would. I, I would probably assign Stingley to them. I mean, I, I to me, I think these three, the, the top three corners, I, I could put in the top fifteen for sure. Where they go, how they go, um, it wouldn't make that much difference to me. The, the Seahawks, the Seahawks always mess me up. I mean, they. I feel like I can almost write down edge rusher for Seattle and just go every year. That's, that's kind of where they're going. And, you know, why am I messing around with this thing? But who knows with this one, what do, what do you have for Seattle? I would go Charles cross here for Seattle. Oh, that's State. right. They're really hurting. They left have tackle, no right? tackles. That's right, right. They have a six rounder and a UDFA from last year. Pencil it as their starter. So. You know, it, now that Russell is gone, does this become more of a Pete Carroll style? In other words, are we going to go back to some power football here at this point? And Cross, to me, is the pass blocker. You know mm -hmm. how I feel about that. Um, but Icky and, and Neil, if either one of them were around here. They won't be around. So, like, the, the debate then here would be penning. Trevor Penning, the Northern I'm Iowa. Free. I'm not going there. I know, right? I'm not he's, going there. He's the smash mouth run yeah, blocker. Yeah, I'm man. not going there at all. I, I don't think he belongs in that class of people. So, all right, I, we'll go. I'm I'm, I'm just going to do I, I, the tackle position if there's one left. I, but I'm not going the, mm -hmm. the top three, yes. Beyond that, no. And then the Jets come back to round out our top ten. Um, I, 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 I've got to see – I think they're going to go receiver one way or another here. Okay. I think Jameson Williamson comes off the board here. I, I, Jameson or Drake London, I don't think they can go wrong. But I think they go Jameson, just speeding that offense. Is, it, it kills. Speed kills. Speed kills. Uh, Zach Wilson, though, needs an easy completion. I I, yeah. I could see London being the guy for them. I, I really could. I Jameson Williams, that's counting a lot on your quarterback being able to go – make plays and do things and I, I just think they need completions they need just need mm -hmm. let's get them going let's get them started here so anyway it's always fun i i appreciate your time you're the best in the business you're fantastic that. doing this we're we love having you um and next week when the draft show comes on in case people don't know right we do our draft night show and uh you're heading Nights. it up and Nights I'll, and days. I'll, I'll come on and go, yeah. ah, I don't like that. I'm like the grouchy old man on the show. So we'll have some fun. I'm but that'll be Thursday night. But it's not just Thursday. Like we go all the way through Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right? The whole draft mm -hmm. is right here at PFF. And uh, we hope you tune in. You know what we need this year? We need the draft sound is the biggest thing that we were missing. The, What's the, the draft sound? Da -da 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 that sound. We don't when have When a pick that? comes in, the pick is in sound is the best sound in the biz. We need it on the show. Can we steal it? Or I, I don't know it, if that's I copyrighted, sued. whatever, but we need our own sound, something. Maybe we just it's let's get our own beat person. Let's create it. our own. Can we just can we just create our own? We can. We we need to do it though. It's it's a necessary piece. It like you hear that noise, the the pick is in noise. I don't care where you're at. You know exactly what that means. Huh. So we need that. Gail, get Gail on that. Okay, Austin Gail, that's your new assignment. There you go. All right, Mike. Thanks, bro. For sure.